Thank you so much for being here this early in the morning. It's like a lot of people think there, there are no mornings in Vegas. We're proving them wrong consistently. And uh, anyway, we're going to talk about measuring the IQ of your threat intelligence feeds. If you are from the internet and you do the Twitters, we have like a hashtag so you can hashtag the talk and stuff that you hate about and that was making fun of us. Please do because I want to laugh of everything later because I can't quite check Twitter here. It's kind of lame but that's the way it is. So uh, uh, without further ado, I just, I don't like talking about myself. I just brought here a very special guest, Ms. Wendy Nader. She's going to do the introductions for us. Where's my, wait, you didn't bring my fez and my cup of rum. All right. Good morning again, everybody. I want to introduce these awesome guys. Um, I'm a little annoyed with them because um, in my analyst role, I cover threat intelligence, and they, in this talk, just did something that I had wanted to do. But they probably did it a lot better anyway. Uh, we have Alex Pinto, otherwise known as the brain from Brazil. Is that right? <laughs> Um, he has been giving he's been giving talks at all three conferences this week, and and people just can't get enough of him. Uh, he, and his hacker spirit animal is the caffeinated capybara. <laughs> now Kyle Maxwell, on the other hand, uh, is a math smuggler. His spirit animal is the axiomatic armadillo. But I, I'm here to tell you that actually um, he is a fugitive time traveling Karl Marx and there's a reason why his initials are KM. Oh. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I just, like I had that. to out you like that. So uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Mondo. Um Anyway, uh, we're going to cover uh, a bunch of stuff. We're just going to give a brief introduction about threat intel and really go into what is this crazy idea about measuring threat intelligence and what kinds of stuff we can do to measure? So anyway, without further ado, I'll just have Kyle do his magic. Please. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to talk real quick um, about threat intel. We didn't want to do just a threat intel 101 for those who have maybe thought about it before, but we were going to get too advanced because honestly the stuff that we're talking about today, we'll talk about what that really means for us. When we talk about threat intel, when we talk about intel in general, there's really two things that we really actually care about. And it's not IP addresses and it's not hashes. It's capability and intent, right? What can your foes, I hate the words adversaries and all of that, so I'm going to bring it back Viking style. What do your foes, what are they able to do and what are they intending to do? What do they want to do? What are they planning to do? That's what you really want to know so that you can prepare on your end for whatever it is that you need to do. So that's the core idea that what we're trying to measure, honestly most of the time what we look at in Threat Intel is capability. What are they doing? What are, what are they able to do? Uh, we don't spend enough time looking at what they can do or rather what they're, what they're planning to do. So we'll talk about that a little bit. There are a couple of key concepts that I want you to be able to take away um, where there are some dichotomies within this field. And so we're going to talk about the kind of these cage matches between things that oppose each other. So one of them is signatures versus indicators. So Dave Vitale, for example, has made the point very correctly that a lot of times the way people use indicators or indicators of compromise sounds like signatures, right? But that shouldn't be. If you're using them that way, you're doing it wrong. The idea is that an indicator kind of, or rather a signature says this is definitely something that happened here. It's like a fingerprint, right? You have a very, very, very high degree of confidence that this means X. Whereas an indicator says, hey, look over there. There's something fishy going on. And it, you may have different levels of confidence. You may even have a pretty dang high level. But the reality is that it's not to be used for blocking. It's not to be used for complete confidence is supposed to indicate something that you need to go look at. The other thing, and I'm going to kind of deflate a little bit the rest of our talk here, is the difference between threat data and threat intelligence and data and intelligence in general. Now we talk about threat intel feeds here because that's what vendors typically label as th them as, but they're generally speaking they're doing it wrong. It's not threat intel because it's data. Data without context is just ugh. What are you doing, right? 
if you want intel, you need to do a lot of things, right? You need to be able to establish some context around it. You need to be able to add some of that uh, intent and capability understanding that we talked about a minute ago. And as we're going to see, you kind of uh, escalate up the abstraction of what you're looking for. But since this is what vendors sell it as, we wanted to make sure that uh, people at least know what we're coming in to talk about. There's also there's between tactical and strategic intel. So tactical intel you can think of as the, the how and the what. Like what they're attacking, how they're going about it. Whereas strategic intel, and this is a continuum, this is not a binary either or, towards the strategic end you have the who and the why. Who are my foes? Why do they care? Why do I care about them? And this continuum is important to understand what type of intel you're getting. And then very briefly we talk about at atomic indicators versus composite. Atomic indicators are an IP address, a uh, packet string that you're looking for, a hash. And composite is when you pull these things together and now you start to get some value out of them because I really don't give a shit about a particular IP address but I do if I see it combined with these other things. Now a colleague of mine has a concept that I like to, that he calls the pyramid of pain. And I always use it because I like to say it like that, the pyramid of pain. And the pyramid is basically this idea, that at the bottom of the pyramid, and you can quibble, and Alex and I do, about what's easier and what's more trivial, IPs or domains. And the honest truth is it really depends on context if you're talking about domain generation algorithms versus uh, phishing or, or what have you. But the idea is either way, they're kind of at the bottom. They're, it's pretty easy to get a lot of IP addresses, right? It's also very easy for your foes to change their IP addresses. As you move up this pyramid of pain, you get network artifacts, that are a little bit harder for you to analyze and figure out what to look for and a little bit harder for the attacker to be able to change on his end. Whereas now when you start to get to specific tools and TTPs which are tactics, techniques and procedures, how these guys go about what they're doing, that's much harder. It's much harder to change your process than it is to flip a bit and have the hash come out completely differently. Now that said, we talk about simple, easy and trivial as we're going to see through the rest of the talk. That's not always that they're simple and easy but relative to these other things, right? With that said, I'll hand back over to my brother here to go into his analysis. So, I mean just a side note, I think if he did like the pyramid of pain thing in a falsetto voice it would be much, most funnier, but much, much more funnier but anyway that's, that's just me. It hurt my throat. Yeah, well, okay, it's your throat anyway. Uh, so I guess the point here is like, um, like I was talking about, I mean, should we care more about domain names, should we care more about IP addresses if that's all you got? I mean, ideally all our intelligence would be bunch of, bunch of contacts in it, we'd all have like fluffy animal names attached to all of them and yeah, it would be awesome. We would really understand what we're up against. So uh, let's say that we, and I really want to work with IP addresses here. They have a bunch of interesting uh, stuff that we can uh, use them for. And uh, the thing that uh, is interesting for me, it's a, it's quite a, it's a finite resource. Like people are always bitching about IPv6 and stuff like that. And uh, the fact is there is an intrinsic cost of getting an IP address and changing an IP address. Some places it's easier or less easy for you to get an IP address to do bad stuff, right? Some people are quite onto it, right? Some, some data centers, some providers they will like if you try to do something a little bit weird they will shut you down almost immediately. Others you like you have to talk to them with email for like three months while they're just simply ignoring you and stuff just stays there forever. So maybe there is some uh, structure, there is some pattern there and uh, I'm actually proposing that if we're getting a bunch of these IP addresses why don't we try running some experiments in them to see if we can learn a little bit more what this threat intelligence landscape is. And I don't say that like in the threat intelligence landscape like all capital letters like uh, what the world is doing against the world and cyber war and all those things but who is actually trying to get you, right? That's the thing you should be most uh, concerned about. So anyway, let's try to do some science here, right? Can we measure 
how much a specific feed uh, is going to help, how is it going to help us in our strategic uh, uh, defense uh, practice that we're trying to do in our organization, right? Can we actually get something out of them? Are they just a bunch of numbers with dots in them? I mean, what, how can we actually measure and I have some ideas and I wanted to share these ideas with you. So uh, actually I put together, all of this is, is, is GPL3, it's a bunch of uh, statistical tests and uh, data visualizations that you can do. You do have to use R and I almost did it on purpose so that you guys start to get to know some statistical languages. Guys, get with the times, man. Like in five years it's all going to be data. I'm sorry but that's, that's pretty much it. So yeah, okay, there's, there's some Python dude here beside me, he's just going to be bothering me the rest of the talk. Anyway, all the code is there, the sample data that I use for the talk is there, so you can rerun everything and just say, hey, there's a bug here, you're such a stupid guy, and stuff like that, or you can like, look how I know how to use this graphing uh, library much better than you, you can do all those awesome stuff. And uh, also, all the graphs and all the data that I show here is in a markdown file, so it's pretty much, okay, here's some blah, 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 here's the code, here's the results, so you can actually follow through if you like. It's all on the repository, there's a link to everything there. So anyway, let's get started, I think. How, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'm good. So, just for you to guys to have a general idea, right, what, uh, how did I structure this data, how did I try to like create a sample database or something like that. Uh, first of all I was trying to extract what I'm calling the raw information from these feeds, right. And uh, I extracted both IP addresses and host names because yeah, we got, you got a bunch of them. Oh, just a, a side note, uh, all of this data is publicly available, right. So uh, all this stuff that I've gathered and I'm, I'm going to show here, you can, might as well just gather. And we actually have a treat for you by the end of the talk that you, we might just be able to help you a little bit with that. Uh, but uh, the point here is, okay, you got like your IPv4s, you got uh, your FQDNs. Um, I did this weird thing, it, it may sound weird at first, where I'm calling stuff inbound or outbound. Um, and it's pretty much, I'm just trying to differentiate very broadly between the types of threats, let's say, that these IP addresses and domain names provide me. I mean, not so much domain names for inbound, but uh, so think about the, the way the data flows from your organization or your IP or your dingly thingy internet-y thingy, right? Think about the direction as things go in and go out, right? So if it's someone that's scanning you or sending you spam, I'm calling that an inbound feed. And if something that, okay, you have to access this website to download this malware automatically or it's a dropper or it's a CNC, I'm calling that outbound, right? And that's pretty much the list of the, of the feeds that I was harvesting. There is actually a mistake in this slide, so you, you're free to call me out on the internet if you figure it out. But uh, the, um, the point is, and all of this is documented, which feed is which, but if you guys have been playing around with this, you should recognize most of them almost immediately. So how did we prepare this data for the, for the experiments that we're going to talk about? Uh, first of all, we, we o I only wanted to work with IP addresses. Uh, first because there's more interesting uh, uh, topological stuff that you can work with uh, as opposed to domain names. And uh, I do plan to do something uh, similar to this using Whois data in a future installment of this. Uh, specifically for host names. But I, I was only willing to work and I, frankly I only had time to work with IP addresses so I just ran all the domain names through a uh, passive DNS database, specifically the, the, the Farsight one. You just may or may not have seen Vixie here uh, before me. Uh, where, okay, for that day that I got this indicator, what were the IP addresses that were active that day? Right? So assuming that you had that data and you were taking some sort of defensive measure at that day, that would be a, a, the IP addresses you would have flagged as weird or malicious or suspicious or however you take your threat intelligence. So we also removed non-public IPs. We don't care if the IP resolves to localhost. That's, and that's obviously a parking technique but it, it wasn't really conductive to, to what we were trying to do here. So anyway, we're, we got this domain names and IP addresses and we made them a bunch of IP addresses. After we did that, we went to do some enriching on these guys. So we want to make sure that we were able to identify what were the ASs that were associated with the IP addresses on that specific day, right? So it, this is, a, I mean, th there's a period of time that we have the data for and that's when we did those, we did those enrichments, right? Also country from geolocation databases 
And uh, we also resolved the, the remote host, also using passive DNS at the time. Uh, and uh, I had some plans for it, but we didn't quite, it wasn't really interesting. The data was too sparse. There was not a, a lot of cool stuff to, to show. So, uh, just a side note as well. Although we are doing geolocation, right, there will be no maps at this presentation, okay? Maps are not a good way to look at data. Please stop doing that. I mean, if the country is big, you think they're more of a threat. That's how the brain works. They look at stuff, it's bigger, it's more important. Stop using maps. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is a this is a sample, right? And uh, you can have you can see exactly how uh, easy or not it is to actually use the code uh, uh, that I put together to actually okay, I'm going to load this from my from my database, and I want to see it, and I want to see what data is in it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see there some examples of things that people thought to be bad in a specific moment in time. All right, we got our data. So what we're going to do with it? Uh, I propose three different experiments here, right? And uh, I'm calling them novelty, and it's actually a pun because it's, it has both meanings, right? It, you can either use it because, yeah, that's how much this feed as is, is actually refreshing itself as time goes by. Or maybe it's just like, yeah, I'm gonna add a bunch of stuff and take a bunch of stuff out, you know, you're gonna look like really active. But anyway, uh, we, you gotta know how your feeds are updating themselves. You wanna make sure that whomever you're getting them from, be them open source or be them uh, commercial, the guy's actually putting some work on it because, I mean, things move around, I guess. Um, there's an overlap test, which is one that I, it's, I mean, it's, it's the most simplest thing ever. You're just like, okay, let's compare ev everyone against everyone and see how much they have the same indicators, right? And uh, this is specifically useful if you're actually trying to buy something right? Just get all the open source feeds that you can get a hand off, hand, hand off, compare them against the commercial feed and yeah, how much am I actually getting for this ex I don't know, I completely lost the world but like this ridiculously expensive amount of money that I'm paying for this, right? And finally, the one that I think that's, it's, it's much more exploratory and it's, it, there's a little bit more of math than the other ones which I'm calling the population tests which is can the data that we're getting actually teach us something about our adversaries, right? Can we actually learn something foes. from this? Sorry, foes. sorry, foes, foes. Uh, can we actually learn something from this? Can we actually find some patterns uh, on this attack? Uh, anyway, population is tricky, right? I'm doing some, some examples here where uh, I'm comparing against the whole population of IP addresses where they should be at least and also should ideally mean your data. So get your data and compare how are the IP addresses that your, your company accesses or are access, is accessed by your company uh, uh, against the, the actual threat intel feeds. Anyway, we'll get there. But I was looking for an IQ. I wanted a grade. I wanted, no, no we're not gonna get there. And uh, specifically, I wanna make sure that you guys understand that um, this, uh, the idea here is to make sure that you guys are able to, to, to reach your own conclusions, right? Whatever I think it's right for my company as far as the specific mix of threat intelligence or I should be focusing on this and that is going to be very, very different from whatever you're doing at yours. I just want to make sure that you understand, feel free to publish your own metrics, you know, feel free to tell that X, Y, Z sucks or something like that. I'll try not to do this because, I mean, I kind of like data and I don't want to piss off everyone at the same time. So yeah, I want to get on their good side, you know. Yeah, if you want me to do this work for you, I can help you You're out. You're so nice, Alex. You're so nice. Yeah, well, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I do intend to do, s I will do more private research on this because uh, there is, all of this comes from the other research around machine learning that I do. So I had actually had to go through all of this that I'm explaining to you to figure out which were the threat intel feeds that I would use in my model. So I just thought it would be interesting to share. Anyway, when a novelty test. So we're measuring pretty much added and dropped indicators, right? So how much stuff are be is being added day by day? How much stuff is being removed day by day, right? And if you run this kind of thing, you'll get something like this, right? This is specific for inbound. 
so this and uh, so alien vote is actually uh, divided because they got both stuffs in there. It's majority inbound, and like you see, there's a lot of inbound stuff. And uh, it's because it's fairly easy to get. Like you just run a couple of, of honey pots, and suddenly, yeah, you're like threat intelligencing all the way to the bank. Uh, <laughs> that sounded worse than I meant it to sound. But anyway, uh, the, the point here is you want to make sure that your your uh, the stuff that you're doing is actually refreshing itself with something. So you can see there there's like a 20% refresh in one of them, sometimes 50%. You definitely do not want the guy on the lower, on the lower right. I mean, they're not dropping any IP addresses, right? The, the, red, the red line is how much it's being dropped, so it's an upside down graph, and the, the blue graph is how much is being added. So this guy is adding a minimal ratio of stuff. This is all in percent, this is not in absolute values. And it's not removing anything else. I'm not sure this guy is doing the work. Uh, it looks like abandoned to me, right? So it might not be a good one to actually uh, keep forward, uh, keep using forward as you go forward. Uh, but not updating every time does not mean that it's bad, right? So this is an example from outbound, right? So also you got stuff moving up and down, you got some uh, things adding or not. And uh, as a rule of thumb, if something is being updated hourly or being updated daily, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of automated stuff going on there, and uh, it's potentially getting information from other sources as well, and uh, it's being presented to you with little or no human interaction and review. If it's something that's uh, more like weekly or something like that, maybe there's some people uh, there's actually doing the work and curating and everything. Of course, when I say all of this, I mean specifically about open source. Right? If people are getting paid to actually deliver this to you, they might as well give me hourly, humanly curated feeds all the time. Otherwise, I should not be paying for them. That's at least that's my opinion. Uh, anyway, it's cool because you can see some patterns, right? How uh, a dom a Mauer domain list, the Mauer domains, they actually had a huge spike on a specific day. Uh, if you guys are wondering, that was right about the time we had that no IP thing with Microsoft. And people got to know like a bunch of new domains and they want and everyone started sharing it. So yeah, you can actually see when it, when stuff happened in a way. It's 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 kind of cool. But anyway, do this test. Run this and see how much your feeds are updating and see if uh yeah, does it sound right for the size of the company or for the, the kind of data that you're reading that they're actually looking at it? I mean it's it's uh it's uh it's a leading indicator of quality. It's not the, the last word that you can have. We can talk about overlap, right? More data is better, but there's so much you can give your Hadoop vendor to actually store all the data. So let's try to keep it, uh, add on, only add data that it's not the same or it's useful. I mean, it's easy for me to say that because I don't, I don't really care. I do a lot of summarization on the stuff that I, the way that I consume threat intelligence. Some people actually use uh, the fact that something appeared in multiple feeds as, 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 as a quality assurance, right? A bunch of people agreed on this. Eh, they might not have all of them done the research. I just want to do it out, leave it out there. But I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's just that uh, you have to make sure what you're looking for. So when you look at inbound, you get stuff like this, right? So the brighter the square, uh, uh, there's more overlap between those specific feeds. And this was a specific day in time. And uh, you can rerun this test for, for all the 30 days that I have uh, on the data set and you can take your own conclusions about, uh, I mean, who is potentially drawing this information from the same kind of honey pots or the same kind of research, right? I have no idea what's going on in the sense that, oh, this guy did that. And honestly, I don't really care. Uh, I just want to make sure that if you are ingesting this and if, if you're working with this, you're not just like, oh yeah, I got two million indicators here, all the IP addresses in the world. And, but you're, it's not like, yeah, but it's a bunch of duplicates and that's not really helping uh, your bottom line. Uh, something that was actually, I found was very uh, interesting and it actually uh, relates to information I, I, I've, I've heard privately is that when you look at outbound, there's much significantly less overlap, right? So it seems that uh, people are, uh, they are doing their researches or their work in some specific niches. And specifically some people they will uh, specialize in a specific threat. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm specific zoos hunter. 
I'm a specific whatever, something else hunter. And I mean, a bunch of examples. And, uh, and uh, but, huh? Okay, sorry. And uh, what we get here is a little bit on the domain only feeds, on the, on the host name uh, only feeds, you get a little bit of overlap. Uh, I just wanted to point out that specific day on, uh, on, on the, that you had that spike. On that day, there was actually a 25% overlap of potential indicators between malware domains and malware uh, domain lists because they, they all updated very quickly to add all that information, which is very good, it's very positive. But, and then you see that result also represented here, right? Because you can effectively measure the overlap that those feeds have. And uh, yeah, also, yeah, you, you can also, also from this uh, graph, you can, you can very easily see that a lot of the, inf a lot of the stuff that the, um, the abuse age guys put on their Zeus, Zeus feed is also uh, being uh, used by uh, alien vote as well, which also I think it's good. Not everyone. There, I know a lot of people who, who use alien vote. I don't know a lot of people who use the, the abuse CH stuff. But anyway, let's get to something which is a little bit more interesting, I think, which is the population test. And uh, I guess it's, uh, it's interesting, and this is, this is kind of a cornerstone of the research uh, that I started doing uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which is, you know, maybe, maybe stuff isn't random, right? Maybe it's not like, maybe we can actually track there's some sort of likelihood that some uh, specific corners of the internet are more likely to be targeting you or not, right? And all the different information that you gather from those different uh, providers or different feeds that you're looking, they will give you uh, different information. And uh, there is some sort of alignment that I believe that you should be uh, trying to reach uh, when you're talking about uh, here, here is my data, right? These are all the IP addresses that I'm communicating to. So potentially the threats that I have, the people who are targeting me or the people who maybe have already breached me and like are exfiltrating data, they are probably from that pole. You know, it's not going to be like an IP teleporting thing, right? And I'm not talking about which type of animal, where the, from the zoo you come from. I'm talking about at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, but there has to be a way that the data is being ex exfiltrated. The, the IP address is there. The guy who is out to get you, the guy who is potentially messing around with your data is on that list. So why don't you try to tailor uh, the threat intelligence and the research that you're doing through the uh, specific countries and ASs that actually make more sense to your data, right? So then we start just doing some comparisons and, and doing some tests, right? And um, uh, we come up with some interesting things. I specifically separated the domain, the outbound and the inbound stuff here. And of course, I mean, on the inbound, China all the way, right? And uh, I can see some people smiling here. Yeah, I can totally see you. Uh, and, uh, um, and that's, I mean, but at least in my perspective, the, the actual uh, penetration of those kinds of things and people who are doing SSH scans or they're like, they have this, three-year-old Joomla uh, exploit that they're running against the whole internet, right? Eh, I don't think these guys are really going to get in. I mean, if they do, you, you shouldn't be on this talk. You should be like on 101 or something. But, <laughs> but uh, the point I'm trying to make is that when you start looking at the outbound data, you know what? It's not that different from uh, the, and it, it is different in some respects, but the fact that China wasn't the first one and the first one was actually the U.S. actually made me chuckle. Uh, actually, if you, if you squint, you can see that the actual proportion, and I'll get there, the actual proportion of Chinese IP addresses, which are actually distributing malware, is less than the actual Chinese proportion of IP addresses in the internet. So, I mean, maybe they're less likely to be hosting malware than other countries, so which I think is, is kind of funny. But uh, anyway, you can play the same game with uh, ASNs, right? And uh, the prevalence of Google there obviously uh, startled me, and I'll get to there later. And at first I was looking at that and I was like, okay, this is a bunch of park domains. Everybody knows that when, when the, this stuff is, the domain names, they are, uh, they are, they're not being actively used, like they're changing their infrastructure. So someone just took the botnet down and then, oh my God, we have to put something else together. They'll just park it all on 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1 or something like that. And those are all owned by Google. So at any moment in time, 
like a, a very high percentage of your uh, uh, domain names from these open threat intelligence feeds will be pointing at Google. Be aware of that. But even so, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't be evil and all that. I mean, I'm, I'm with them. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is this kind of population test, they can also help you key way your feeds, right? And I'll get to the specifics of that, of that pretty soon. I just wanted to show you the graphs and now I'm gonna get to the math. I'm sorry about this. Uh, but uh, the point is I don't like to squint, right? So let's do some statistical inference testing. Let's compare the proportions, right? So if I know the exact proportion of IP addresses on, on the US, right, just get any geo IP uh, database, right, and make sure you are like keeping with it, right, it doesn't make sure to enrich in one database and use another one. So uh, we can do, we can actually do an exact binomial test, which would be, okay, assuming that the, 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 the yeah, I can just choose randomly the IP addresses that are going to attack me, does that, is that consistent with how the IP addresses are distributed? And even if I don't have the full population, right? And uh, I'm only like comparing my sample of my data against the sample of the threat intelligence feeds. I can use something that's the chi-squared uh, proportion test which is similar to the independence test. So it which pretty much asks the questions, okay, these are two different samples of stuff. Do, do they look like they came from the same population, right? And it's a little bit more fi fuzzy and fidgety than the other one and the, that's why the other one is called exact, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a statistical tool that we may have, right? So I really wanted to get an idea of our error measure, right? I really wanted to get confidence intervals and say that, yeah, it's something among, amongst these lines, but at least I can, I can tell you, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm messing up here in this calculation, but this is pretty much how much I'm messing up, right? And I can also use p values. I mean, I, I, I personally apologize to Alex Hutton for using p values and not like doing some Bayesian evil shit. But uh, yeah, and uh, and he said it was okay. So yeah, I'm I'm allowed to do this talk. Some people have to clear with with their lawyers. I have to clear it with Alex Hutton. So the point is, if we're doing uh, p values, we're being very conservative. So for the number of tests that we do, we're we're supposing we are we're assuming a 95 percent because that's pretty much what everyone does. But if we're doing multiple tests, we're actually dividing the, the our critical value or the the value that we use to, oh, there's something interesting here by the number of tests that we do. So what does that look like? It looks like something like this. So I have this, uh, I'm, I'm using this function which actually extracts the population from a specific threat intel feed. Again, it's all there. And I'm comparing it to my known uh, uh, MMGO uh, database. And uh, lo and behold, it seems that uh, Thailand is the winner right now, which may be the, the, the proportion is 5% more than the number, than the, their actual proportions on the, on the IP addresses there, right? Followed closely by the US. Okay, Russia is there. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys that. And, uh, but if you go to China, China is the second least likely to, to actually be hosting something in comparison to, to the random proportion. So I don't know, maybe it was not these feeds, maybe these feeds were not tracking specific actors for there. But that's not the point. The point is if that's the data that you have and the data that you should be comparing, that's, that's what you should be analyzing. You want to add something? Okay, you're just gasping there. Okay, did I say something wrong? No, you're good, man, you're good. Just keep dropping knowledge bombs. Co-presenting is hard, man. The guy's judging me right beside me. I mean, I can't really see you because of the lights and this guy's like there. Oh God, wh how, why did I get into this? Uh, but anyway, uh, but if the p-value is higher than our critical value, which is the last one there, it's pretty much, eh, we can't really say anything. It looks like the, it looks like it's, it's on par with the, with the randomness that we would get. Uh, a challenge that we got when we reached this conclusion uh, is that, hold on, I don't know what to call these countries yet. Right? Come on. I mean, we do not have like cuddly animal names for all the countries. So we propose a guide, right? And uh, so that as you, 
as you are trying to create your own and you are creating your own threat intelligence with those statistical techniques, you can actually, you know, call people and, I mean, attribute people to, to what you're doing, right? So just a clarification, uh, Capybara is like south, southwest of Brazil and Tucan is more like the Amazon part. I mean, there's very, very different hacker spirit animals. Just, just be conscious of that. Where are my Texas people at? Yeah! All right. Anyway, this is not a complete, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? So feel free to tweet your own suggestions with the hashtag of the talk. We had, we gotta catch them all, people. <laughs> we gotta catch them all. Anyway, um, then we get to the non exact test, so the actual chi chi square test. And uh, this is just a, a little thing that I did trying to compare how the feed evolved and changed from uh, the uh, uh, 11th of July to the 12th of July. Those are, th this are the, the same feeds, what they change, like from the one day to the next. And you see a bunch of them are pretty much the same on the, on the bottom side, but then Thailand again is at it. That there's actually a trend from this information that you're getting from your, uh, from your threat intelligence feeds that Thailand is getting more likely to attack you based only on the data and the geolocation. So if, if you got, I, th I can see some of you guys have got like the, the, the brain thing going on and that's exactly what I'm hoping for. There's a lot of interesting stuff and a lot of interesting conclusions you can get from your own data and not so much in the threat intelligence feeds also trying to do something like this. And by the way, while you're at it, at the animal thing, we do need something for Thailand because they're like everywhere on this presentation, they're obviously to something bad. <laughs> tweet it, tweet it, tweet it. Yeah, we can't really hear you. So um, then I wanted, I was, I was bothered by this Google thing, right? And I wanted to make sure that I could understand uh, if it, this is all park shit or if it was actually uh, something different, right? So I ran the same test, the same uh, exact proportion test on the AS information as well as the population information. And uh, yeah, Google was like 10% proportion increase. That's like, that's crazy. That's, that's, that's too much. That's way, way too much. And then, what? Ah, okay. Where is he? Okay, I don't care. You told me. Um, and uh, what we get there is, um, if you actually look into the data, you'll find that, yeah, maybe not so much. Maybe it's not just park data. There's some cleaning that needs to be done. I mean, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Chrome, but I'm pretty sure it's not malware. And uh, so probably we shouldn't have like chrome.google.com in our threat list. But it's all right, it happens sometimes. And uh, you just gotta be sure if you're consuming this kind of things, you're in the lookout for, for information like this. And maybe, maybe those tools can also help you do a little bit of triage because no one is gonna look through the whole thing all the time and that's pretty much the point. But anyway, I talked about a bunch of shit and I, I talked about my data. And uh, what about your data? How can you get your data uh, to, to use those statistical stats. And, and for that, I'd like to invite back my good, good, good friend, Kyle Maxwell, has put up with me through all of this. Oh my God, thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so as you're pulling in these feeds, you want to be able to do this test yourself. You want ongoing data. In addition to being able to run these analyses for yourselves, you may have other uses for the data, right? Um, in this case, we did a lot of the work for you, but ongoing, you need something to help you with that. So what we did was we are releasing to this week a tool, tool called Combine. You can get it right now. It's GPL version 3. Um, and what it is, it's a tool for harvesting and processing these types of feeds. I just wanted to point out that at MLSAC project, we're very serious about our needle in a haystack jokes. So this is why this is a combined harvester. Right. And I am not implying, but well, maybe I am, that that's all hay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a few different components to it. Reaper pulls it in. We really, really like this metaphor here, as you can tell. So we reap it, reap it in. That just pulls in the data directly. We'll normalize it to a very simple data model. We do the little bit of validation and enrichment, so we throw out all that RFC 1918 shit and things like that, do the AS numbers, the DNS lookups and so forth. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we transform the data currently just into CSV or JSON. We just um, haven't released yet the Cybox and uh, Sim for Splunk. And as this is an open source project, help us help you. Feel free to submit pull requests for if there's another output form that you want. Um, we're constantly trying to feed more data 
into it. Um, this can be your own data sources. There's a number of uh, tools in there to bring in CSV, XML, straight text, um, parsing HTML, what have you. We have a number of feed sources bundled in there in terms of the URLs that it can keep pulling. That's not saying, we're not saying clearly based on the last half an hour that any of these feeds are good or bad. These were just the ones that we have and we'll add more as time goes on. When we do the enrichment, when, if you're not familiar with the term, think metadata and metadata accessories. And so we're, we're pulling the uh, autonomous system and geolocation only down to country level from the MaxMind database. We do DNS resolution from the Farsight passive DNS database. That requires an API key. If you have one, fantastic, you can plug it right in. If you don't, go ask them for one, tell them Alex Pinto sent you and he'll get you hooked up like a used car. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but Alex, will, Alex uh, and the uh, uh, really good folks over at Farsight can help you out with that. Um, <clears throat> Again, all of this is open source software. This is not commercial. This is not us trying to make a buck off of, of these tools. This is uh, you know, us trying to make things a little bit better and help you pull in these feeds and pull in your own data as well. Yeah, and uh, honestly, I don't think that's where the cool stuff really is. And uh, actually, this is, uh, I, 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 we had to build a lot of this as we were building out the research that we were doing for, uh, for MLSAC project. And we just figured out, yeah, but this is like very commoditized stuff, or at least it should be very commoditized stuff. So we want to make sure that uh, we are replacing our stuff. Our internal stuff is being replaced by these open source uh, versions and we want to make, uh, we will continue to support them as we actually need to use them, dog fooding and all of that. So talk to us about the project if, you, if you're interested. Uh, if you like the specific CIQ test, you want to test your data against it, you want to, oh, but I don't want to publish my feed, we can totally help you out. Either you setting up your, your own stuff to do that or we can help you out do the test for you, right? And uh, I just want to, some very quick takeaways before we are kicked out. Uh, look at your data, that's all I'm asking, right? That's all that you should be doing right now. And uh, I'm, I will try and as much as I can to, to keep banging this point forward and actually providing uh, helpful tools that people can, can use for that, right? Uh, I also feel very strongly about the asymmetry of information. So if people tell you something is good, don't take their word for it. Just try it, right? Just test it and make sure that it's appropriate for what you're doing. And uh, anyway, if you just got data lying around, you know, we can take it out for some exercise, you know, we can play some games. Like, Fresh air. Yeah. Think about like data sitting, like, like dog sitting. <laughs> we can do, totally do some data sitting for you guys, right? So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>